makes sad music for sad people. You may know him from his latest song, Millennial Life Crisis. He's playing at Incarceration Festival 2022. Please welcome Zach Cash to the podcast. How are you doing today? What's up, man? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Cool. So just just to get right into it, what was your first experience with music, or how, how did you get into that? Oh, man, I've been making music for years. Like, I started playing guitar when I was, like, eight. And, um, you know, I just grew up on, like, my grandma always playing, like, Elvis and Johnny Cash, and then my parents were, like, super into hair metal. So, like, Bon Jovi, Death Prince, and stuff like that. And then as time kind of went on, I discovered Cradle of Filth because my dentist gave me a copy of Nephedamine. Yeah, it, like, completely changed my life. Um, from there, I kind of got into, like, more of the emo rock. Like, I got into, like, My Chemical Romance. Uh, 30 Seconds to Mars was, like, popping off super hard then. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't know, I just kind of fell into that subculture and really vibed with that music. And so what do you think kind of made you gravitate towards that rather than any other kind of music? I don't know, probably my lack of dopamine. Uh, that's one reason good yeah. reason but I, I don't know man like I just really like you know the huge choruses that these people were creating and like the cool end up lyrical concepts and you know especially like Mike Kim you know I remember buying Three Cheers to Sweet Revenge when I was super young and understanding that you know it was a concept so the record told a story and just really loving how they were able to take this story and still make it relatable to people so mm-hmm. definitely a big one for me was lyrical content and then also just the music, the structure of the songs were great. So mm-hmm. yeah. And so when you were growing up, when you were younger, eight years old playing guitar, were you, were there any other dreams or aspirations you might have had? You know, a lot of kids want to be like the athlete, the astronaut, fireman. Were there was there anything you thought you would be doing in life other than music? Not really, like you know, ever since I can remember, it was always music. Like, I, I used to say I wanted to be like, I used to really like Dragon Ball Z and Yu Yu Hakusho as a kid. Mm-hmm. And I said I wanted to do that when I was like, you know, six, watching like, Tanam. Like the voice acting for it? Yeah, like, I, I always really liked that. And it's still something that interests me. And a lot of my friends do voice acting professionally. And it's something mm-hmm. I'm super interested in. But not nah, like, I, you know, I, my parents pushed me to play sports, and it didn't work out. It wasn't for me. Um, I never really had the desire to be like an astronaut or a firefighter or anything yeah. like that. But it was always just, oh yeah, I want to make music. Mm-hmm. And so, is there any like tips or advice that you would give to people just starting to make music, just discovering their passion for it? Just do it. Like, I, I struggle. Like. I'm not the best singer in the world, and I fully recognize that. I don't think I'm the best lyricist. I don't think I'm the best songwriter. I I just do it because I have fun with it, because it makes sense to me, and it's something I enjoy, and it's what feels right to me. So if someone says you can't do something, if someone says, oh, you're not a good singer, you're not a good guitarist, like do whatever makes sense to you. And the rest will come in time. Yeah. And um, you you say that you like doing it like just for fun. It's kind of always what you've wanted to do. Is there any specific level you want to get to with the music? Whether it's like just being able to fully sustain yourself off of that is the goal, or like being one of the biggest names in the industry is the goal, or anywhere in between. So I don't know, man. Like the way I look at like my songs and life in general like all my songs are super sad and um i'm a really big advocate for like doing good for other people like i I do a lot of volunteer work with the down syndrome community and the autistic Mm -hmm. community and i think it's really important to just kind of share my message on a broad spectrum of like hey like it's cool to be depressed it's cool for it's not cool to be depressed but it's okay that you're depressed it's okay (laughs) yeah Yeah, exactly it's okay to be depressed it's okay to have problems with your mental health but we're all on the world like 
we're all in the world together. So try to do something to help other people and it'll help you in the same process. So by extension of that, um, as my music has grown and my social media following has grown and stuff like that, um, that's as it continues to grow, that's kind of my goal is to be able to spread like, hey, it's okay that you're really sad. You can try to do something positive and yeah. hopefully make it a little better. And so with, with being so honest in your music, you know, spreading the mes- message like, hey, you might have these problems going on. If that's okay. Like other people have it too. A lot of your lyrics are about mental health. How, for your personal mental health, how how has music kind of helped you with that, or has it benefited that and like put you in a better mindset? Word. So like, um, I got a piece of advice from a therapist I was seeing when I was probably seventeen, and she told me to try and write stories about like people who were dealing with things that I was dealing with. So I could look at it from an outside perspective and to try to get this character to recognize and then solve the issue. And that was extremely therapeutic. So that eventually led into doing that with poetry and then led to doing that with music. So whenever I write lyrics or whenever I have an idea or something I want to get out, it always starts with me looking at it from an outside perspective, being like, okay, this is how I'm feeling. These are these emotions. Let's, let's really dive into these emotions so I can figure out what's going on. And then I can pick them apart and start taking them by one. So that way I'm able to solve my issues. So Mm -hmm. like, you know, Hayes, for example, that song was super, super personal. And like, I was really just so depressed. I'd gotten kicked out of my old house and like, uh, it was right when the pandemic started. So I was, I, I'm very much a social person. Mm-hmm. So like whenever I would be upset, I would just be like, okay, I'm going to ignore this. I'm going to go out to hang out with friends. I'm going to go to a bar. I'm going to go do something. And I wasn't able to do that anymore. And I was really inside my head fixating on how I was feeling. And, I don't know, it just turned into a really vicious cycle every day of just being sad. So, that's what I wrote Haze about. And writing that song really, really helped me get through those feelings, because I was able to recognize, okay, this is what I'm feeling, this is why I'm feeling it. Mm-hmm. Let's get a part and start figuring it out. You know, I moved in with one of my friends at that time, and got out of that living situation, and started you know still within guidelines for COVID at the time but um started trying to solve new ways to communicate new ways to expand my my friendships and be involved with people again mm-hmm. so and that song hey is you have you have the original and then you also have like a reimagined remix version of it what kind of made you want to return to that song and work on it more and come out with a new style for it so johnny is one of my really good friends and uh hayes got to like 50k streams and i hit him up and was like yo hey dude like songs at 50k um it's doing pretty well you want to do another one like you want to do another song and this is before like i had the idea of doing a pokemon cover with him mm-hmm. and he was like, yeah, dude, sure, I'm, I'm super down. Um, what are you thinking? And I was like, I don't know, man. Like, people really liked Hayes. Maybe we can run with that a little bit more. So I hit up one of my friends. Uh, his name's Michael. He lives in Russia. And I was like, hey, dude, like, um, I'm going to send you this song. I'm going to send you some ideas that I have. Um, I'm going to track out some stuff. But, like, you know, let's send stuff back and forth. I want to get you involved with helping me on making a new version of it. And me and him sent it back and forth for a while. And then we got the instrumental where I was super happy with it. I had tossed it at Julian from Loveless. He's the producer I do almost all of my stuff with. And I was like, hey, Julian, like, can you kind of mix this up a little bit? Like, just kind of make it sound a little bit more polished? Because I, I don't mix. I'm terrible at mixing. 
and uh, he sent it back to me. And I was super stoked on it. I sent it over to Johnny. He was super stoked on it. And yeah, it was just kind of a natural evolution. And then we did Pokemon, and that one was fun. And so this kind of reimagined version of Hayes, what the first time you released Hayes, it was about your struggles with the start of the pandemic, and it kind of helped you get into a better mind state, help you with that. Did returning to it also benefit your mind state then, or like help boost your mental health at that time? I think it was really nice in the sense of like diving back into that song. It just showed me like, hey, you know, like, this time last year, you were feeling like this, and this was really, really, really bad. And it reminded me I've made strides, and I've come far from where that was. And, you know, even if I still resonate with it, and I still feel like that sometimes, I'm able to recognize, hey, you know, I'm, I'm making steps to get better from that. So it was cool to go back to it and see how far my mental health has come from the moment I initially wrote it. Yeah. And so, was there ever kind of a moment where maybe you're, maybe it was mental, maybe it was just financial, anything, was there ever something that kind of came up and made you think about stepping away from music, taking a break, whatever it was? So, like when that? I was, it's like 21, um, I was still living in Georgia, and I had... When I was 18, I was making metal music. I was screaming in a band. And um, it was when I first started wanting to learn how to sing. And the producers that I worked with, I hit them up and I was like, hey, I want to sing. I want to start singing on songs. Like, I'll toss you. I can't remember. It wasn't that much money. It was like two grand or something small. And I was like, let's get together. Let's work on some songs. You guys can. And they were like, okay, cool. Can we come to your house and like record at your house? I was with my parents. And I was like, sure so they came over and i started you know we started working on music and one of the producers i remember he, he laughed at me when i was recording and we all went outside and they were like yeah you should really like give up on being an artist like you can't sing you should really give up on it like this isn't gonna work and that really bummed me out it took about a year I, I didn't take a year off i was still working on music but i took a year off of my own music like a year off from being in a band or something like that i did like you know some ghost writing for people but dominantly I, I took a step away just to really reevaluate like if i can't sing if i'm going to listen to these people I, I need to figure out what the next step of my life is and I had a bunch of friends in LA and they were like, you, you should just come out to LA. Like you can do anything in LA, make it out here and realize music's not for you or you can get into acting you can do this that, and this. And, you know, I did like a little bit of acting stuff for extra money. I was learning how to tattoo for a little bit. And I like, you can see me as an extra in a couple Netflix shows, but like nothing felt right. So I moved out to LA and, I was living with a DJ who worked with Julian from Loveless. Me and Julian became really good friends. And I was like, hey, I have a rap that I want to make. Like, I want to make a really stupid, ignorant, sarcastic rap. And um, my buddy Shamu sent me a beat. And me and Julian hung out and, like, he, we worked on it. And he was like, dude, this is hilarious. And I um, ended up opening up to him about the other producers. And he's like, dude, f*** up. Like, you, you can sing, do it. Yeah. And he's like, I'll help you do it. And um, it was it was so nice. Like, I got in and um, I was working in a band called Kuza at the time. I was playing guitar. And I wrote this song. It had a really cool EDM chorus. And I was like, I'm going to sing on it. I tracked it with Julian. And it went really, really well. And I was super stoked on it. And after that, I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to. I'm going to keep practicing on singing. I started taking lessons from, you know, a couple of friends. And mm -hmm. I just practiced a lot to a point where I got better. And I wasn't so pitchy and I wasn't having all of the same issues that I was having. And I started a pop punk band. That band ended. And 
it ended up falling into putting stuff out under my own name. Like that wasn't the plan, but it just happened, and it was really cool. And so the name you go by now, Zach Cash. What inspired that? How did that come to be? And what's the story behind that? Cool. So that's my real name. <laughs> so many people okay. are like, so many people think it's a stage and name. Not your real, real name is spelled with the two Ks for Zach. Yeah, oh, it's Zachary. But yeah, no, that's that's always how I've spelled my name since I was learning how to spell my name. So because my initials are Zach, my initials are. Z-A-C. Mm-hmm. So just to kind of differentiate from that is where the two Ks came from. But like I've always spelled my name like that. And yeah, my birth last name is Cash. So that Cash. It was just um, mm-hmm. the way it happened was me and so I became really good friends with Lady Beard. And I was like, me and Julian were kind of like working on some of his solo stuff. And I was like, hey, dude, I have this really weird idea. Do you want to do a Dragon Ball cover with me? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, cool. I was like, yo, this uh, this girl follows you. Her name's Amelie. You should totally hit her up about doing the song. And she was super down with it. And then it just expanded to me hitting up like all of my friends. Like, yo, you want to do the pre-chorus? Yo, you want to do the chorus? Like, And that song was so cool because like it's all just like my close friends that I was hitting up. Like, yo, you want to do this? Hey, like, let's do it. And it was right before the pandemic. And no, it was so cool. And like, I initially wrote the song to like give to someone. I was like, I don't want to put this out. Like, you put it as featuring Zach Cash, like, you know, with featuring Julian Camo and featuring Lady Beard and whatever. Whoever puts it out. And Amanda was like, no, I don't want the song. Like, it's not my style, uh, it's too heavy. Lady Beard was like, oh, I can't, you know, Japanese management, they won't let me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Julian just started doing Loveless. So he's like, oh, I don't want to put anything off of that. So I was like, you know, you know I'll just put it out under my name. And all the money, or the first year of streams went to a Action Against Hunger, which was a charity that was doing a lot for, like, poverty-stricken countries whenever COVID started. Mm-hmm. And first year of streams went to that and I was like okay fuck it like whatever and then it did really well like you know the song it's still my most popular song on Spotify and did really well and I was like okay well I have a few other songs that I have ideas for and I'll just start putting out random stuff under my name so that's when like Lost Without You happened and Sanctuary from King of Hearts mm-hmm. did that with a you know, bunch of people too and that one did really well I was like, oh, well, okay, I guess I'm just going to keep writing this out and putting out sad songs under my own name, and, you know, a band will come along eventually, or whatever will happen will happen, but mm-hmm. you know, it's going to be for fun. And then I got the opportunity to do incarceration. I was like, okay, I guess this is, like, my thing now. I guess I'm a solo artist. Cool. <laughs> whatever. And so a lot of the songs you have are like that. You got this roster of people as a part of it. What's it like... You're you're kind of blending like band and solo artist. You are a solo artist, but you keep working with all these people on one project. What's it like bringing all these people together for like one thing that you can look at and say like, yeah, this is our thing. You know, that's kind of what I love about music. Like being in a band sucks. It's really it really sucks because it's almost like you're in like five relationships at once. You're like in a relationship with everyone in your band and everyone has to feel a certain type of way. Everyone has to feel good. <clears throat> but as a solo artist, I can just do whatever I want. And with like these collabs and these covers, I'll just hit up friends or I'll hit up people that I listen to. And I'm like, hey, like you want to work on this? Here's the song. And you know, I'm <laughs> very fortunate that a lot of them have been like, yeah, super down sounds cool and I don't know man it's just like my favorite part about making music has always been to like collab with people and meet people and something that everyone can be proud of and everyone can be stoked on so like I guess the collabs just happen naturally Mm -hmm. from being like wanting to work with friends on stuff so I can hit them up and be like hey like I got this instrumental I did with a friend in Russia like you want to 
sing on it or hey me and julian did this at three o'clock in the morning at his parents house you want to work on this like it was it, it's just a natural thing mm-hmm. so, it's really cool doing it live sucks but you know and so if it whether it's someone in your family just someone who makes music another artist just a friend is there anyone who has kind of inspired you just in life in general yeah man like um, I had an uncle who had Down syndrome, mm-hmm. and I grew up in, like, a very conservative, small town. Like, the population of my hometown was, like, 3,000, which is insane because I think there are that many people in our apartment complex now. But, like, that dude was always so positive. Like, I can go on about how much that dude, there are so many times where he should have been upset and could have been, like, mad at the world just the happiest person always and didn't care what I dressed like, didn't care how many tattoos I got on my face, didn't care what I did, just unconditional love. And that was something that really resonated with me, especially when he passed away. Like that amount of love I've not gotten from another person outside of like the people I volunteer with who also, you know, down syndrome, autism and stuff like that. Um, there's just, like an unfiltered love that's just so dope and that really inspired me and changed my life in the sense of like i want to be able to <clears throat> give that to people who don't normally get that opportunity to have someone like that in their lives let people know like hey you know this doing this stuff is cool like these people will change your life like be involved with these kinds of people and you know on other levels like my buddy, I've talked about him a few times, uh, Julian from Loveless, that dude inspires me a lot. Like, he's, he's, he literally, like, the dude showed me, I, I can sing, and gave me, like, so much confidence in working with me. And that's genuinely all of my, none of my stuff would, would be a thing without that dude being like, hey, for these people, you should do whatever you want, you can do it, I'll help you do it. Um, also, like, you know, just all of my friends, like, day-to-day, you know, I have people who inspire me just by waking up in the morning. Like, it's hard. Yeah. And sometimes you don't feel like doing it, but you do it anyways. I never feel like doing it, but we do it. We survive. And so when you're coming up with a new song, for a lot of them, it seems like you kind of already have this idea in your head or a concept of what you want it to be about or what the story would be but once you start actually like getting down to it making the music do you do lyrics first beat first a mix and like what's it like so like it's weird like i'll have an idea and be like oh i kind of want to do a song like this and i'll start writing like lyric ideas like just basic like like with millennial life that one was supernatural me um, and Julian had just finished making Goth Girls, and we were at Kyle Black Studio in Van Nuys, and we we're outside smoking a cigarette, and I just started going, dun 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 dun, and I was like, hey, dude, that could be kind of cool. That could be a first. Let's do it. And he went inside and he started playing around with drums, and I just started writing like, you know, I find myself at twenty five, it's going to go outside, and it just naturally came and then like we got on the chorus and I started laughing because I had this idea and I was like am I seen out I forgot your face like that's so silly and Julian was like no that's cool lyric like roll with it so I just kind of built around that but that those lyrics I feel like they came naturally because you know whenever a journal or anything that was going on I was like super stressed out because I was about to turn 25 and I don't know it's just like super freaked out because it's like I'm not where I feel like I should be I'm 25 mm-hmm. like you know I have friends who are touring the world playing Jimmy Kimmel and like you know people who are on documentaries in my life who are doing amazing and I just I don't feel like I stack up so I was super I was in like a super beaten out point so those lyrics came super naturally and <clears throat> everything else just depends on the song but I always have, like, a base idea of lyrics that I can pull from just from, like, my day-to-day writing. Mm-hmm. 
I always try to write before I go to bed, so. And you said that, like, this wasn't really where you pictured yourself being at 25. Now, do you have any plans for the future where you want to be in two years or so, or just at any point in the future? Like, have you planned out what you're doing, or are you just kind of going along with the flow? Yeah, dude, I'm, I think when I was struggling with turning 25 and then I woke up the next day being 25, I, I realized nothing, none of my preconceived notions of what I should be doing mattered. And to just take everything day by day, you know, like whatever happens, like if I wake up one day and I decide music's not for me anymore, like I don't want to do it, I can't beat myself down for it. It's just the natural progression. I have to do whatever feels really right to my spirit. So if that means I'm 40 and working a desk job making like 19 bucks an hour, that's what I'll be doing. But Mm -hmm. I'm just taking it day by day and doing the best I can every day. So it's up to the universe at that point, right? Yeah. And so for your tattoos, anything you do with that, do you, are all of them, do you try to wait for like a meaning behind them or have you just kind of gotten some spur of the moment, like, let's have fun, just put this on my body. Dude, yeah, my tattoos have no meaning. I think I put thought into, like, three of them. Like, a lot of thought into my chest. I put a lot of thought in my Disney-themed arm. And I put a lot of thought into my hand, for the most part. Oh, no, I'm going to take it back. I didn't put a lot of thought in my Like, I didn't really, oh, my throat. I did put a lot of thought into, like, my neck. Mm-hmm. And kind of my face a little bit. Most of the stuff on my face I've put a lot of thought into. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, everything else is not, dude. Like, I have friends' names tattooed on me who don't know how to tattoo. But I was just like, hey, like, we're in a tattoo shop that I work at. You want to tattoo your name on me? Like, let's go. Like, I don't put any thought into it. Like, mm-hmm. my knee tattoo, my friend Mariah was at my house, and she was tattooing me. And I was like, I really want to get my knee tattooed. She was like, oh, what do you want? I was like, I don't know, like. We were watching Dragon Ball, and I was like, but someone from Dragon Ball, I don't care who, she did Master Roshi on my knee. But, yeah, I, I don't put any thought into it. Like, mm-hmm. I do, it feels right in the moment. I vibe, and if I have a cool idea in the moment, I don't regret any of them so far, so that's cool. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's all in the moment, and just what and, happens. Mm-hmm. And you seem to have, like, no, mostly everywhere on your body, at least most places. What was kind of the place that, like, hurt the most to get a tattoo? I don't know, man. Like, least painful was my cheek. Like, getting this little sword mm-hmm. on my cheek, that didn't hurt at all. But man, most painful, and my throat was really bad. Like, getting your Adam's apple tattooed really hurts. Yeah. I remember I was with... Um, one of my friends and like I lifted up from getting my throat tattooed and the entire chair was just covered in sweat like it hurt so much uh, my stomach really hurt they all hurt man <laughs> but like I think the throat and then like your head is the worst that I've had also the palm really sucked mm-hmm. and so just going about your day maybe walking around or something a lot of times when you have this appearance of tattoos everywhere, face tattoos, you know, a lot of people kind of have preconceived notions or past judgments, um, and they're usually negative. Like, what do you think we could do, like, as a society to kind of try to change that? Because there are plenty of people who are like that who are just normal people or even, like, better than average and better than these people you see, like, no tattoos, wearing a suit, going to their job, and, yeah. Yeah, I I think it's naturally happening. Like, being tattooed is so common amongst millennials, and now that, like, we're starting to be the generation that's actually taking over, like, you know, boomers are starting to retire, boomers are starting to kind of step down as much, like, and we're starting to take over in society I guess you could say it's just a natural like it's not weird anymore like 
you used to be like you got your throat tattooed you were like the biggest badass and like you were in a biker gang or you jumped in prison or something mm-hmm. now like any random guy in a bar but more than likely especially if you live in LA someone's got their throat tattooed someone's mm-hmm. got their face tattooed it's just natural now so I think in time in society like it's just gonna be a norm and no one's gonna care and I don't know man like I, I get out here I get less weird looks than I did when I lived in Georgia in Georgia I got like so many weird looks and, like so many old women who would look at me and just start hyperventilating and be like what's up Karen yeah like you probably shouldn't run away from Walmart like because you saw me and like walk in the opposite direction but yeah Live your best life, girl. And um, so, obviously, you, you're you very open about your mental health struggles you have with that. Um, do you get any hate online, I'm sure, whether it's about your music, just social media in general? Do you get any negative comments there? Uh, a little bit. I mean, I think more people respect the transparency like, mm-hmm. you know, I'll get stuff like, ah, oh, your music's so cringy. You're too old to be emo. I'm like, dog, I'm, I'm 25. <laughs> like, I'm not an old, like, when did I become a senior citizen? Like, I don't well, that's, understand. That's kind of like what a lot of things online are. And they're like super hip, super young things. And a lot of the, like, emerging artists now are, like, still in their teens, like 19, 20 coming up. And then by the time they're, like, 25, they they have had, like, two, three albums, like, a substantial career. And by the time they're, like, 30 or even younger, they, they like, could, in theory, retire. And that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, totally. So, I mean, as far as negative comments go, dude, like, it's mostly positive. I mean, I've gotten some stuff that's just, like, oh, you're so cringy. Like, this song is so cringe. You're just acting sad. No, like, I'm not. I'm an ex- mm-hmm. actually who it's a really bad relationship. My next original song I'm putting out is actually about the relationship. But um, they were always like, you're, you're not even really, like, you're just, like, you overemphasize how sad you are because you're a sad boy and you're emo. And, like, I'm not overemphasizing. I'm just not hiding it. Like, I'm just Mm -hmm. being, and I'm not saying, like, I'm embarrassed because I have a hard time falling asleep because I start having panic attacks, or I I don't hide that I'm struggling with something. Like, I think it's important to be transparent, especially online, like, when you gather a following. It's just important to be transparent about, like, I struggle with this, this is who I am, let me hate me, but Mm -hmm. this is real. And I feel like a lot of artists now who are open about their mental state are kind of just being honest with their audience about what they're going through are some of the biggest artists now. We see tons of giant artists, Billie Eilish, 21 Pilots, they talk about these struggles they have, they talk about what happens to them at night when no one's around, and they have millions going on tour selling out these giant stadiums and i think totally. it's because while they might get hate for that they'll also get tons of people who are like hey i'm feel the same way i'm glad i'm not alone and let's vibe out about this dude i have a picture printed out it's it's in my closet right now because i just moved and i haven't set up my room fully yet mm-hmm. i have a picture right now i print out a screenshot of a kid when I was 18 I was in a metalcore band and made a song called The Rehabilitation and I wrote it about like I was super 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 hooked on drugs and uh, I ended up getting off drugs because I started having seizures and stuff from all the cocaine I was doing mm-hmm. that wasn't fun but um, um, okay we'll get we'll come back to that finish what you were saying yeah but I'll um I, I got a message from this kid and they were like, hey, look, I've been struggling a lot with my mental health and I'm going through all of this stuff, but your song really speaks to me and it makes me feel like I'm not alone. And that that clicked with me and I was like, holy shit, like, I don't need to write old songs about like 
anything other than what's going on. Like, I just mm-hmm. need to be transparent in my music. And I don't know, like, anytime I'm sad or anything like that, I look at, like, some of the <clears throat> messages of people saying that my music's helping them. That makes any hate, any self-doubt, any problems a million times better. Mm-hmm. And for all these people who relate to you, they're saying that you've helped them. I'm sure, maybe not all of them, but most of them are people who have the same problems as, as you. They have trouble falling asleep at night. Maybe they have all these doubts. They don't really know what they're doing. What would you kind of say to people struggling with any kind of like mental battles? You're not alone, and it sucks. Like... It took years for me to get on antidepressants. It took years for me to recognize I have a problem with eating. And it's, it's taken a long time for me to recognize, like, okay, I have problems with this. But once I recognized, like, I'm not the only person going through these issues and there are ways to help them, that's when, you know, I got into therapy. I got, you know, help with my mental health through my doctor. My doctor's awesome. Number one, I love my doctor. But, he gave me um, some awesome anti-anxiety medicine, and it's helped a lot, and I was so scared of it, and very thankful that I got over it, man, because it makes life way more bearable. Mm-hmm. So, if one were to say anything like that, I would tell them, like, go talk to your doctor, don't be scared of, you know, the repercussions of taking medicine, and don't be scared of repercussions of being you. Yeah, and medication therapy a lot of these things that would ultimately help people have these general stigmas around them that people kind of look at you differently or like think like oh oh, you're in therapy like what what happened and it's not always something that happened it could just be like something going on in your head what do you think we could do if there's anything we could do to kind of normalize that and say like hey this is something that people do they will do and it's okay it's just a way for to help them yeah so uh, for me the medicine part was the thing that scared me was because you know like i said due to me drugs or having seizures and epilepsy and medicine now which I'm super thankful the medicine works but anytime i take new medicine anything i'm always so terrified that like it'll mess with my seizure medicine or something like that Mm -hmm. so that was my main concern over the anti-anxiety medicine was like oh man what if this like doesn't work my seizure medicine or something like that and i was so so scared of it but my doctor was like look dog you you need this like you have a lack of dopamine like you need this this will help you Mm -hmm. and you know conquered the fears and got on some awesome medicine that makes life more bearable. And I was also really scared of like losing myself in the medicine. It didn't happen. One thing though, uh, to touch on what you said, I think that it's becoming more normal, like, especially after COVID, like yeah, definitely. one's mental health took a big suffering from that. And I think that like under the understanding of like, okay, being sad is normal. Taking medicine to get over that struggle is okay. Because so many people who never were able to recognize, like, oh, I have this issue, all of a sudden were left alone with themselves. So they recognized, oh, man, like, my mental health isn't great. Yeah. And so you... I'm, I'm, I want to make sure I heard this right. Did you say you have, like, seizures from epilepsy and that yeah, and yeah. That's a, so. yeah so basically i um had a bunch of stuff happen super close together when i was like 16 like uh i got kicked out of a band and then after i got kicked out of the band my uncle died after my uncle di- or after my grandpa died then after my grandpa died my uncle died the one i was talking about earlier mm-hmm. after that my dog died two months later after that <laughs> like so much happened and i didn't you know you're 16s like whenever you're 16 you're young you don't fully comprehend like why you feel this way or comprehend a lot of the stuff that's going on so i just ignored it by doing a bunch of drugs and drinking a lot so i did 
too much. I went too hard one night and I woke up the next day, felt really weird. And then the next day when I woke up, I had a seizure. I went to the doctor, I had another one in the hospital and they were like, Hey, so you have epilepsy, which like, I didn't recognize at the time. Like you can have a seizure and not have epilepsy. Mm -hmm. Having epilepsy means you have more than one. So as soon as I had that second one, they were like, Hey, yeah, you have epilepsy. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, like basically what my doctor said was like, I had, I always had like the possibility of having a seizure, but there's something called like a seizure threshold in your brain. And I did too many drugs. So it kind of lowered that threshold. So I could like, yeah, it just made it to where it was way more likely it happened. Yeah. But I got on medicine and that's been great. And I don't do drugs anymore. So that's also been good. And, yeah. And any of these problems, seizures, um, self-doubt, anxiety, any of these things, do you find that that can sometimes make it hard to go and play live or, like, do a lot of the more interactive, like, real-world things that are involved with being an artist? So at first, yeah. Like, when it first started happening, I was playing bass in a band, and, like, I was so scared to play live because flashing lights, and even though that doesn't trigger my seizures, like it's still like, you know, synonymous with them. So I was super terrified about that. Um, sleep deprivation is another one. So I was like super scared to stay out late or, you know, have to do stuff and not get enough sleep or whatever the case is. It was super scary. And it's still something that I still kind of struggle with, but you know, I've been seizure free for nine years, thanks to my medicine. And, yeah. um, yeah, I just kind of forced myself through it. I recognize like this is an irrational fear. I'm covered with my medicine. And I'm good. I don't need to trip about this. And I kind of forced myself to, which is another benefit about being an artist. It gives me a reason to kind of like force through these fears mm-hmm. because I'm the performing live and meeting people and, doing whatever that means way more to me than anything else Mm -hmm. and with music growing up around all these different genres all these different styles playing with different styles different genres when you make music do you sometimes take like a little inspiration from other artists and if you do how do you balance that with also like having your own unique sound in there and putting your own style you know man, i just have fun like this next song i'm putting out the way it happened was i was hanging out like me and julian booked the booked some time at Coblock studio in van nuys and we had just finished millennial life and we had a few more days and i was like i kind of want to make a song that's like my two favorite bands that had a baby so i was like let's take my favorite band him and my other favorite band depeche mode and fuse them so Julian kind of came up with this cool synth pad and we started kind of rolling with it and we made this cool like goth pop rock song and you know even millennial life like you know if we were to look at those three songs back to back goth girls is like i rap in it and they're screaming in it and stuff mm-hmm. like that and then you compare it to millennial life which is like a pop punk song and then the next song is called touch the flame and that song is like a gothy rock tune so, I don't know. I, I always take whatever I'm feeling in the moment. Like, <clears throat> when I was working on Ladybeard stuff, heavy and, like, super vibing with the whole Japanese J-rock, J-metal stuff, mm-hmm. I was putting way more, like, dancey synths in my songs and, like, you know, I'm just vibing with it. So, mm-hmm. kind of, I don't know. I, I don't really try to stick in a specific genre. I just make really emo music and whatever fits in the moment. Yeah. And um, if you could kind of, you, you, it might be one of those two favorite artists that you mentioned, but if you like got the opportunity, had the chance to make a song with any artist, any band in the world, who would it be? You know, man, him is my favorite band. They're not a band anymore, but like 100% like is my favorite band. Bill Vallo is like my favorite singer of all time. Uh, outside of him, though, like a band that still exists, 
I would probably say Bring Me, Bring Me the Horizon, Cross Faith, mm-hmm. Bullet for You. Those would all be really cool. Yeah. Uh, and then for your Instagram bio, it says you're a dad joke enthusiast. Hell yeah. You got any dad jokes for us right now to share? I always get dad jokes. I used to have a dad joke blog that I did every day on Instagram for like three years. But you can hear a lot of dad jokes in that time. Yeah, dude, it was great. <laughs> um, I don't know, man. Like, I think, oh, here's a good one. Uh, whenever I die, I want someone to put a bunch of uncooked popcorn in my stomach after I die. <laughs> Because I want to be cremated, that'll be more interesting. That's a good one. Uh, why'd they build a fence around the graveyard? Why? Because people were dying to get in. Oh, yeah. oh again. <laughs> Dad jokes are probably some of the best joke formats out there. <laughs> oh, dude, I have dad jokes or rad jokes tattooed on my side. Um, and so... Other than uh, some of these artists you mentioned, Depeche Mode, him, what are some of your other like favorite artists that you have that you just like listening to? Uh, it fluctuates, dude. Like I listen to everything. I listen to some country. I listen to some rap. I listen to some rock. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I always mm-hmm. say the top five is him, Depeche Mode, uh, Bring Me the Horizon, Cross Faith, and. I'm mean, probably like Manchester Orchestra would be like my top five. Yeah. But. Well, I'm I'm kind of the same way. I think I I could probably have like a few top ones, maybe like three, four. Like definitely, like these are my favorites. They're probably gonna stay there. And then like the fifth one, I'm kind of just like that changes. I'll listen to an album from an artist and like start really liking that artist, and then. I'll hear a single on the radio and like try to find out who made it and then start listening to them a lot. And so I usually have like four constant and then one like change and rotate and one. And then um, from the music you've made, is there a song that's your favorite or that like you kind of like the most? I like them all for different reasons, dude. Even the covers, like, Mm -hmm. you know, I love Love and Break because it's all of like my best friends. Like, I talk to those people regularly and i love all of them um pokemon was really cool because it was like a bunch of my friends and then like i love jonathan young i looked up to jonathan young so hard and when i decided to start doing covers like jonathan young was like one of the people i looked up to and getting him on a song was super cool uh, shane smith was super cool because i loved him mm-hmm. uh, yeah, dude, like, they're all special to me in different ways, like, the originals, too, like, Goth Rolls was really cool for, you know, the content, Haze is really cool, because it's the first time I worked on something with Johnny, and obviously, you know, I told He's, you about like, the meaning. something that you feel strongly about, yeah. Yeah, uh, Millennial Life was really cool, just because it was the most natural progression for a song I've ever had before. Mm-hmm. Uh, Touch the Flame is cool, they're all cool in different ways, so... It fluctuates day to day, but if, like right now in this moment, I would say my favorite one is probably Touch the Flame. I really like that one. Mm-hmm. All right, well, those are all the questions I had for you today. Thank you so much for coming on. Do you have anything coming up, new songs, anything like that that you want to promote? Yeah, um, you know, come see me at Incarceration. Uh, that one's going to be super fun. Uh, uh, I got a cover of Standout from the Goofy movie with Golden Boys and Jordan Scott coming out next week like friday next friday the 11th mm-hmm. and we're working on but now touch the flame hopefully in may so yeah right. well that's what you have looking forward to where can people find you online instagram if you have a website anything like that where can people find you uh, i'm on i am zach underscore cash on all socials that's instagram twitter and tiktok i forgot what all socials were for a second but yeah, uh, Zach underscore cash on everything, so you can check mm-hmm. me out there. All right, and I'll leave a link to some of that down below. Thank you so much for coming on today. Cool. Thank you, man. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I wanna have it all